The International Court of Justice just delivered another landmark ruling concerning Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine that, judging from Netanyahu's furious reaction, must really hurt. So let's have a look at this. Before going into the ruling of the International Court of Justice, or ICJ as I will call it from here on, let's make it clear what we are dealing with here. Because while this is a highly significant decision that had to be duly voted on by all the court's 15 judges, it is not an enforceable judgment over a concrete case brought to the ICJ by a UN member, like the South Africa case against Israel. There is no guilty verdict or punishment attached to this one. What the court produced was a so-called advisory opinion on a legal matter which the UN General Assembly asked it to produce. Why did the Assembly do this? Well, advisory opinions from the ICJ are the most authoritative interpretations of international law that you can get. It means the court's 15 lawyers and their teams studied a certain legal question for months and years and then delivered a judgment in the sense of a, you know, super expert opinion on this matter. In the practice of international law, these opinions then become sources of law, which itself can have several purposes. For one, they can be the basis for future verdicts on concrete questions if members decide to drag each other to the court. Uh, secondly, they can also inform UN members at the General Assembly and in the Security Council of what the law actually says, uh, which makes it easier to argue for or against resolutions that might be proposed, which is something we can expect to happen in this case. The General Assembly will certainly in the future create resolutions that will be based on this verdict, among other things. So the second thing to note is that while Israel forcefully rejects the ruling and uh, certainly won't adjust its behavior, this is a big setback for the Zionist project. You see, international law is not like domestic law. It's not enforceable the way that domestic law is. It also doesn't come about the same way as domestic law does. Domestic law is made usually by legislative bodies, usually called parliaments. They are more or less concrete rules which are then used by the state machine to structure social life inside a country. International law doesn't work like that because there is no world parliament with the same force over everyone. The UN General Assembly might look a bit like a parliament, but it really isn't. Uh, this, it isn't the same kind of institution. International law represents first and foremost the, you can call it, general collective will of the international community as expressed through treaties, declaration, custom and expert opinion. So what this verdict signifies is another instant of the world not recognizing Israel's claims over, Palestine, uh, over Palestinian lands of course, Israel is angry now and says literally, and I will show you that here, it literally says um, that, uh, where are we here, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, sorry, uh, this one here I want to show you, Mr. Netanyahu literally said that the people of Israel are not occupiers in their own land and in their eternal capital, Jerusalem. Now, um, this is actually quite useful because you see what this does is it really boils down the, the, the conflict to the core of what it is. The verdict that the uh, ICJ reached means that the world does not recognize precisely that claim of Netanyahu, namely that Israel, by virtue of Jews having lived in these lands 2000 years ago, derives some magical historical right over the land. This is not a concept of international law and won't be one. And Israel is furious about not being able to impose its will here. Because, you know, uh, this is a very big problem uh, for Zionism since Israel's entire political strategy is to just create facts on the ground. Israel's idea ever since its establishment in 1948 has been to ignore international law 
do things that are clearly considered crimes under international law, just take the land, replace the people who are living there, and over time, let that become a fact of international life. Um, this is not even a new strategy, as this is exactly how all successful settler colonial states were created. New people from Europe eradicated native populations, set up their own states, and those became members of the international community by virtue of all other states um, at the time recognizing them. Because you see, um, recognition by other states is really the core of how international law works. International law is the will of the world. So if the world loses the will to oppose Israel and actually recognizes its claims, then those claims will become legal in the sense of being recognized by the international community. Past actions will always remain illegal under past international law, but for the future they will become recognized and the illegality of them will cease to be. And since this is the strategy of since this is the strategy, Israel wins every time states move toward recognizing its claims. Like when Donald Trump decided to recognize the Golan Heights, which legally belong to Syria, as part of Israel, and Israel loses every time someone does the opposite. And this verdict here is very much a case of the opposite. It enshrines yet again in the books of current international law that what Israel is doing is in fact illegal and will remain so for the foreseeable future. The great majority of the world does not share Israel's interpretation of its rights. This is where also the weight of the verdict matters since it was voted on by 15 judges and all of the questions the court ruled over were voted on on individually and were recognized by at least at least 11 of the judges each time. Sometimes some questions even got more recognition by more judges. This means of course that most questions are not a matter of uncertain law or differences in nuance. It is a very clear verdict. Now let's look at what the court enshrines in this current international law. Let me switch back here to my camera to my uh, screen view. So um, here, here it is. This is the advisory opinion um, that was issued on the 19th of July 2024 uh, on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. So the court was asked to give its opinion on what the legal consequences are uh, under international law. And you see this is a 80-page document with over this is the paragraph count so we have here about 285 paragraphs in total 80 pages it is quite detailed and it it goes a very a normal legal structure first it establishes whether the court has jurisdiction or not um, the, the context of the of this uh, opinion then the scope of the meaning of the questions posed uh, applicable law, Israel's policies, it, it reviews the policies, this is also very important, it, it again creates an official record of the illegalities of this, for instance, the violence against the Palestinians, the, um, the extension of Israeli law over everybody, the transfer of civilian populations, it records all of these illegalities and says why they're illegal. This is why this opinion here is quite important for anyone who wants to understand the um, the, the Israel-Palestine conflict, this drama, for, for its legal sense, because here the court establishes um, with authority of how these questions have to be looked at, right? Um, then the legal consequences, we will look at them in a moment, um, arising from Israel's policies and practices and from the illegality of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territories, because it's quite important. The court first looked at the consequences for Israel itself, the legal consequences for other states, and this is going to be quite important, and then the consequences for the United Nations. So the, the court here really created a very a holistic view of what this situation means, not just for Israel and Palestine, but for all other UN member states as well. And this, this is going to hurt um, in, the, in the long run. Um, so, but let's go to the let's go to the actual ruling first because I would like you to know about this one. Um, the the rulings themselves are are on just two pages, um, so it's very nice and and concise overall. The the decisions taken, the court first and foremost unanimously decided 
that it has jurisdiction to give the advisory opinion requested. So court saying, yes, yes, I'm in charge. Um, this, is, this is within the scope of what I can do. Then by 14 votes to one, it decided to comply with the request for an advisory opinion. So the only um, vote against was by Vice President Sebutinde, which is the Ugandan, um, the, the Ugandan judge. And I don't understand, I don't know why she keeps voting against this time and time again. Um, maybe somebody can explain that. But one of the things that is um, quite impactful here is that in, for a lot of the a lot of the opinions, you know, the American judge and the uh, the the other judges from Western countries, they voted uh, they voted along. So this is a this is a verdict that also stands on the authority of not just judges from let's say uh, Middle East or developing uh, developing nations from the global South. I want to say, um, it's also from judges uh, hailing from uh, from Western countries that that. Um, for most de decisions, put their name under um, under the decisions. So the third decision taken um, by 11 votes to four was uh, the opinion that the state of Israel continue the state of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian ter territories is unlawful. It is not legal for Israel to be in these occupied territories. These are still occupied territories and. Um, Israel's actions do not actually revert that status. Um, fourth decision, it's the opinion that the state of Israel is under an obligation to bring to an end its unlawful presence of the occupied Palestinian territories as rapidly as possible. Fifth, it is the opinion that the state of Israel is under an obligation to cease immediately all new settlement activities and to evacuate all settlers from the occupied Palestinian territory. You see how, how this ruling is really, really quite devastating for, uh, for Israel and its, its continued policy of, of uh, putting more and more settlers into these uh, occupied territories. By 14 votes to one, it is the opinion that the state of Israel has the obligation to make reparations for the damages caused to all natural or legal persons concerned in the occupied Palestinian territory. This is a big one. Like this, this now is, is an official verdict that um, Palestinians have a right to sue the to sue Israel for compensation for everything they have lost. This can have like a lot of uh, implication in future cases or even in international law cases or even national law cases because if there are ways that the Palestinians can show that they um, that they cannot get justice from uh, Israeli courts or from international courts then some states might actually recognize their right to sue Israel under local law if the if states have provisions of um, of 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 creating this this institute now I forgot what it, what it is called it is called uh, um, uh, uh, universal jurisdiction um, in depending on on how uh, domestic law works some domestic laws accept that they can rule over claims outside of their of their jurisdiction if uh, if good reasons exist and this might actually be one in the future so there might be law cases um, coming along um, Israel's way not just from international courts but maybe from domestic courts too. Seventh by 12 votes to three it is the opinion that all states are under an obligation not to recognize as legal the situation arising from the unlawful presence of the state of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory and not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the situation created by the continued presence of the state of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. So this is very important because this creates a legal obligation, an official legal obligation, not just to Israel, but to all other states. So everybody else in the world community now knows that they are obliged not to assist Israel in the occupation. This is super powerful, of course, and we haven't had that before as far as I'm, as I'm aware. Uh, number eight, um, by 12 votes to three, it is the opinion that the international organizations, including the United Nations, are under an obligation not to recognize as legal the situation arising from the unlawful presence of the state of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. Also at the UN, uh, recognizing this occupation would be, would be against the law. And uh, number nine, 
by 12 votes to 3, it is the opinion that the United Nations and especially the General Assembly, which requested this opinion and the Security Council should consider, consider the precise modalities and further actions required to bring to an end the, as rapidly as possible the unlawful presence of the State of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. So, um, this one, this one too, this is, the, this is the last one, is just the admission that it should be the, 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 the obligation of the United Nations organization itself to work on this and basically playing the ball back to the General Assembly and the Security Council to keep working on this on a political level because the court is of course a judicial body, not a political one, so now um, it, it, it should go back to the politicians. Of course, of course, this will be um, to a good degree ignored and in the Security Council the, the US will veto all and any resolutions that could damage Israel in Israel's interest in whatever kind of even slight tiny little way. Um, but at the General Assembly there are good chances that we will see new resolutions coming out and that states now will be motivated in, to create resolutions based upon this judgment which could go as far as uh, recommending um, sanctions and, and further actions against Israel based on this judgment because um, you know this is where we should go back a little bit to this advisory to, to the to the expl explanation that come before because this is really these legal consequences for other states this is very significant that these so-called erga omnes um, uh, obligations start occurring um, so the the conflict doesn't only impact the two parties, it also impacts third states. And the, the, the court now formulated rules for third states. Um, among the obligations erga omnes violated by Israel are the obligation to respect the right of the Palestinian people for self-determination. And the, um, the opinion here then says very clearly that other states are obliged to help the Palestinians to realize their right to self-determination. Quite a, quite a long passage here that you can go and read on page 75. And a very, very um, important uh, uh, paragraph is uh, paragraph 279 that says, and I quote again in full, all states are under an obligation not to recognize as legal the situation arising from the unlawful presence of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. They are also under an obligation not to render aid or assistance in maintaining the situation created by Israel's illegal presence in the occupied Palestinian territory. It is for all states, while respecting the Charter of the United Nations and international law, to ensure that any impediment resulting from the illegal presence of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory to the ex exercise of the Palestinian people of the right to self-determination is brought to an end. In addition, all the states, parties to the Fourth Geneva Convention have the obligation, while respecting the Charter of the United Nations and international law, to ensure compliance by Israel with international humanitarian law as embodied in the Geneva Convention. Um, here I need to point out that this advisory opinion was asked for by the General Assembly before the 7th of October 2023. It was, it was asked for, I think, in 2021, it was requested. And the court actually at the beginning of the text says um, it's, it's only uh, looking at things that happened before the 7th of October. It doesn't take into consideration for this opinion everything that happened since and the genocide in Gaza is not even considered in this opinion. So what, it, what the court does is it considers the legal, legal um, implications of the occupation. And it reaffirms it is an occupation. Israel is uh, acting illegally and against international law. It has to withdraw and has to withdraw away from the 1967 borders. Um, and it is the fact that Israel manages to create here um, to impose its its might and its power over Palestinians doesn't doesn't render it okay. That's what I said earlier. This does not make it international law. It is a violation. And very importantly, so why I, why I point out this, this sentence here is that the fourth Geneva Convention is, uh, is one that deals with um, the, the, the rules of, of uh, in, in armed conflict and the, the, the legal requirements not to breach 
these these laws of war on uh, in the in the Geneva Convention. And here again, like this is a direct pass on to then what happened after 7th of October and all of the breaches of international law that are currently occurring of hu international humanitarian law. So again, the court says, no, you cannot breach international humanitarian law. Um, and you're the, the claim Israel's, the Palestinians have a right to self, uh, to self determination. And it doesn't give Israel this right of self defense that Israel keeps claiming all the time in order to justify all of the breaches of the Geneva Convention and, uh, and uh, also by now the Genocide Convention. So, and why this is important is that here we now have a very hard ruling of the International Court of Justice that third states must not help Israel. <laughs> you must not do anything that helps Israel to prolong the occupation. So this can be used by activist groups and, uh, and courageous third states to try to sue others or to sue state organs who might be in breach of this regulation because it, it directly connects not only to international humanitarian law, it also connects to international human rights law. So um, this, is a, this is going to be a very strong instrument, instrument for uh, courageous parties that want to try to go the legal route through um, any institution that they can find either at home or uh, in, the, in the international sphere of like one of the treaty bodies of the United Nations. Uh, or the ICC, again, you could try to use this in front of the ICC. This is just very strong, so um, that it's not just Israel. It's not just Israel that's under, under the watch. It's also the third states that help it. It's also the United States, it's also the European Union. All of these states are now informed that they must not do anything that helps Israel prolong the occupation. That's why the occupation is important, and you know, the. Uh, the thing is that the court recognizes this, uh, the borders of 67. So you might know this famous picture here, right? What Palestine used to look like and how it shrank little by little. And this picture is, is these are not perfect maps. This, is, this would need a long discussion to say like how, how accurate this is or not. But the point is the 1967 borders, more or less, more or less what you see on this picture is what the court recognizes as the actual uh, state borders of, um, of Palestine or as, as legal Palestinian lands uh, as belonging to, to, the, to the Palestinians. So it, it, the court doesn't at all delegitimize Israel. It recognizes the state of Israel. It recognizes the right of the state of Israel to exist. And it actually at the end says um, Israel and Palestine should live side by side, right? This two-state solution is what, um, what the, uh, under international law, what the court recognizes. So it also, the court does not at all justify, for instance, the dissolution of Israel, which is something that a couple of uh, Arab states are demanding. But the, the court recognizes that anything, any um, soldiers or illegal settlements of Israel in these lands, in these territories of Palestine, are in breach of international law. So I think that's what we need to keep in mind. Of course, on the political level, again, don't expect any any changes. We have this. Um, we have, of course, the United States that came out immediately in 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 support of Israel and um, the the State Department that says that. It views this ruling as inconsistent with the established framework for resolving the conflict and that Washington strongly discourages parties from using the court's opinion as a pretext for further unilateral actions. And this was pointed out by another uh, international lawyer uh, to me that this is um, highly hypocritical that the US here speaks of unilateral actions. You shouldn't take unilateral actions. And what they mean is, of course, uh, recognitions further recognitions of Palestine as a, as a state by countries, as you know, some European countries like Spain and so on have already done. The US calls that unilateral action. Um, you know, the recognition of Palestine, the, any kind of recognition of a state by a third state is always a unilateral action. It's always by definition, if, if, if a, a country, if a government decides to recognize another state, then that is a, a unilateral action. What, what the State Department here says is what it wants is 
um, that anyone who wants to recognize Palestine first needs to ask Israel whether it whether it agrees or not. So um, the, 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 the State Department is just so utterly clearly um, so incredibly on the side of, of any of all the interpretations that Israel is giving of their rights that it is um, it is really sad and I really at some point we need an explanation how this how this comes along. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> the important thing I believe is to keep in mind that this is now the expression of not just the court but more or less of world opinion and of international law. The long-term strategy of Israel to just to just create facts and then have them recognized later is not working. Um, this doesn't end their illegal occupation and it won't change their policies immediately, but it means that for now international law is holding. The dam is holding and Israel is not able to break through this, um, through this firewall of international legal opinion. And if this continues, then even if this still takes decades or a century, if this opinion doesn't change, then at some point the political realities on the ground are going to change. Because currently it is, of course, um, the support of the United States and Europe, the military support that keeps Israel um, safe and in place. But one, if that changes, or once that changes, um, the, the, entire, the entire political game will move into the other into another direction and at that point when once this um, military support gets weaker um, Israel will need the support of the international community this part of the international community to um, to continue existing and that's then the moment when um, when Israel might be willing to actually come to a real uh, conclusion of this absolute tragedy and accept the two-state solution and actually move toward resolving the apartheid within the state and the uh, all of the injustices that have been committed. So um, again, international law can't change the situation immediately, but it can it does create the long long-term trajectory. And the good news here is that the long-term trajectory is not the one that the Zionists would like to start taking shape, which is a, a, a moving, a slow moving towards becoming silent and then just accepting the fact that Israel creates. That's not the case. That's the good news to, of today. And we will see whether this advisory opinion will have more serious legal consequences in the months and years to come. Thank you.